I pray that none of you all have that feeling of indifference that I just tried to convey to you. <laughs> that it's another Easter Sunday. What can you do? I think, figured on my fingers while I was in hospital, and I think this is my 75th Easter celebration. Um, or I may be 10 years ahead of myself, I'm not sure. <laughs> but this is not a day friends for indifference this is a day if we were Pentecostal this is a day for us to jump and shout and be glad because Easter folks is the most important day in the history of all humanity it's the day when Jesus rose from the grave and he defeated he defeated the power of death and he won for us eternal life. Christians all over the world begin their celebration today by loudly proclaiming some variation of the word hallelujah. And hallelujah means nothing more than praise the Lord. So I want us to join right this minute with people around the world and I want us to say together that word, hallelujah. So if you will, on my count of three, let's say it. One, two, three. Hallelujah. You know, that's wonderful. That's better than any cheer that came from Crump Stadium over the last 60 years. And believe me, I spent a lot of time when I went to Central High School in that stadium. But to me, as I was in the hospital working on this message, it's a very powerful thing to think about churches and Christians all over the world in nearly every tongue celebrating Easter in their own way. And that's great. The folks down at St. Luke's, they're celebrating the same Jesus that we are. They just do it differently. Over at IC, they do it differently. That's okay. How you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus makes no difference. You just do it. But here's the sad news. Preachers and worship committees and worship leaders spend hours in preparation for the Easter celebration. But sometimes it just does not turn out the way that it's planned. It just doesn't happen. A few years ago, the editors of Relevant Magazine, which is a religious magazine, asked the readers to send in their stories of Easter disasters at their churches. And a young man named Chris Pachoba told that his church began their sunrise service a few years ago with the reenactment of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now Chris played the part of Jesus there on the cross and he was positioned on the cross, which was at the top of a rather tall hill. And he was there, and on cue, he was supposed to be lowered down from that cross into the arms of a man playing a Roman soldier. But what do you have a lot of around sunrise on the ground? Dew. Well, it was wet where that Roman soldier was standing. And as he moved to accept this man who was playing Christ, Chris Pachoba, down, he slipped on the dew. And he fell on his back end. And Chris fell all the way from the cross down onto the ground and rolled all the way to the bottom of that hill. And as he wrote when he ended that article for Relevant Magazine, once I reached the bottom, I had to be dragged off like a dead deer on the highway by a Roman soldier and a shepherd. <laughs> well, when I read that story, I kind of chuckled, and it was about the only chuckle I had while I was in the hospital. And it, I thought how embarrassing it would be to cause such a commotion on such a holy day. But, on the other hand, if you read and listen to the account of the Easter story, the first Easter morning,
from Matthew that Mark read part of. I'm going to read it, the rest of it in a minute. You begin to see that there is very little that's subtle and there's very little that's dignified about Jesus' death and his resurrection from the grave. It's loud and chaotic, an earthquake. And at the same time, it's quite exciting, but you've got to pay attention. People are confused. Everybody's asking themselves, should we be scared? Or should we be overjoyed? What the heck is going on here? So, our scripture, Mark read the first part of, chapter 28, down through verse 6. I'm going to read the second part of it, picking up in, in verse 7, where the angel is still talking to the two Marys. The angel says this, Now, get on your way quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead. He is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there. That's the message. So the women, deep in wonder and full of joy, lost no time in leaving the tomb. They ran to tell the disciples. But then, Jesus met them, stopping them in their tracks. Good morning, he said. And they fell to their knees and embraced his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said, You're holding on to me for dear life. Don't be frightened like that. Go tell my brothers that they are to go to Galilee and that I will meet them there. So they left, filled with joy and yet filled with fear. There's an author and a pastor. Her name is Gretchen Ronovic. And she tells of a story that she and her five-year-old son had one morning, Sunday morning, while they were sitting there eating their Oreos or Cheerios or whatever. The five-year-old had Oreos, probably. She had Cheerios. Anyway, the little boy says to her mom, what are we going to do at church today? And the mother, Gretchen, said, we get to worship Jesus who died for our sins. And you could see the wheels turn in the little boy's head. And he responded, but I heard, I heard that he's fine now. I heard he got well. I heard he's not dead anymore. And you know, in a five-year-old's thought processes, that's the short, sweet story of Easter. That's the truth. That's why we begin this day by proclaiming hallelujah. Jesus is just fine. He's not dead anymore. Just ten verses. The part of Mark and I read, ten verses total. Capture for us these unexpected, earth-shaking, life-changing things, the power and the promise of Jesus' resurrection. And I certainly hope that none of us today or none of anybody else of other churches anywhere in this world leaves their place of worship the same people as we were and they are when we walk through the front doors because we need to experience Jesus' resurrection as if we were witnesses there and as if it were happening right now at 946 on this Easter morning because every person who experienced Jesus' resurrection exhibited a permanently changed life afterwards. They just weren't the same people. Their attitudes, their priorities, the focus of their lives changed radically, my friends, because they had witnessed that risen man called Jesus. And if we really understand the power and if we really understand the promise of Jesus' resurrection, then we are going to be permanently changed by it also. So let's look at just a couple of three things about the resurrection and what it means. And for starters, Jesus' resurrection turns our grief, our grief, into joy. 
Paul tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians, through Jesus, our greatest enemy, death, has been swallowed up in victory. Now here is the hard, fast, not so pleasant truth. Our bodies are going to die. But here's the good news. Our souls will rise to eternal life because Jesus came and he gave his life as a ransom for us. And with that ransom, he defeated the power of death. We no longer need to live in fear of death and decay. We don't have to grieve because our lives have no hope. Our grief is tempered now, tempered with joy, because we know that God is faithful to his promise, and that promise is that one day we read in the book of Revelation, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death, no mourning, nor pain, nor pain. So we are called to live and the assurance of God's promises not way off in the sky by and by, but now we are to live full of joy now, to live as children of the resurrection now, to live as Easter people now. And it's not just on Easter Sunday that we live that way, but it's every day of our lives until the day when those promises are finally, finally, and joyfully fulfilled. I read about this wonderful tradition in the Philippines that on Easter Sunday, the men and women divide up, the women in one group, the men in another group, and they make two processions through the streets of the town that they live in. One procession, is made up of the men and the boys. And they follow an image of Christ as they move slowly toward the church where they go to worship. <coughs> the other procession, it's all women and girls. And they follow an image of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she's cloaked in a black veil and that veil signifies that she's in mourning over the death of her son. Well, each procession goes separately, but fairly quickly they converge and they meet at the doors of the church. And the little girls who are dressed as Easter angels go up to that image of Mary and they remove that black veil. And that signifies that her grief is now gone and that she it's turned to joy as she looks and she sees her son Jesus alive again. And it's that at that point when the veil is gone, when she sees the live, living Jesus, that the celebration begins. Death, folks, has been defeated by the sacrificial love of Jesus. It doesn't hold power over us anymore. It's time. It's time to remove that mourning veil. Jesus' resurrection has turned our grief, our grief, into joy. But secondly, the resurrection of Christ has also turned our separation from God into our into our re reconciliation with God. That's the second promise that we receive through the life of Christ. If you'll remember that when Jesus was dying on the cross, remember who was there? Only the beloved disciple, John, and the women. Where were the rest of his buddies? They'd run, run, run. They were afraid. So when the angel told the women to go quickly and to tell the disciples that, angel, the, that Jesus was going on ahead of them to Galilee, what were they expecting? Were they afraid that Jesus would condemn them? That he would punish, him, punish them for abandoning him? And couldn't we blame him if he did? 
Well, they didn't have to worry for long. Because as the women ran from the tomb, 